So this session uh, is going to be about data visualization in notebooks. And I always feel kind of like I don't have as much to show after going after everyone else who shows all these beautiful visualizations. Um, you know, we saw this from Joe uh, to begin in the morning, right? One of these visualizations, you can expect to see this on the cover of some journal. Um, and we've seen that the tools that have been presented can be used for those sorts of uh, high level, high quality sorts of visualizations. Um, but, but these are also visualizations, right? Um, and perhaps many of you come across these types of visualizations more often than the others, right? As you're trying to get through your code, diagnose what's going on with the simulation or a model or something like this. And they're not as pretty. They're not as likely to grace the cover of a, of a beautiful journal or something like that. Um, but they do serve a purpose, right? Um, this sort of debugging or diagnosing and things like that. Right? And so uh, one of the folks who's done a lot in, in the field of data visualization, Ben Schneiderman, has this quote that the purpose of visualization is insight, right? not necessarily pictures. Right? Pictures are great. They look beautiful. But really, a lot of the goals of visualization are to generate ideas, right? to, to help us gain knowledge about what's going on in our code or in some physical process. So, if we go back to this idea of data analysis, right? So more on the end of after we've computed data, simulated data, things like that, gathered data, right? We have our data to begin with, and then we want to do some computations, right? Statistical computations, um, data transformations, things like that. And sometimes from those computations, we hopefully gain some output. And these outputs can be, you know, arrays. Uh, numbers, things like that, but they can also be visual, right? Things like tables or even plots. And from those outputs, the goal is this insight, right? This perception and cognition. We want to think about, reflect upon what those visualizations show us and gain some knowledge, right? That insight that Schneiderman talks about. And I show this as sort of a linear uh, progression, but, but clearly, as most of you are well acquainted with, there's a lot more where you're going back and forth between these things, right? Once you see some output, gain some knowledge, that may cause you to change some parameters, to rerun things, um, and generate new outputs, right? And so this exploration of really going back and forth between things is much more the norm as we're doing and accomplishing science. Um, and specifically, this link between output and computation, I think, is, is quite important, right? Especially as things are more computational, seeing something about what you're computing um, is very important. We heard about this you know, this morning and, and this afternoon already about in situ visualization, trying to gain more understanding of what's going on, seeing that output as computation is occurring. Um, but this idea of outputs becoming inputs, right, I think is an important thing that drives a lot of the analysis process. Once you see some of the data, choose to filter it in a particular way, choose to run some other types of computations. And so that's one of the themes that I think notebooks um, really pick up on and really try to drive is this sort of rapid ideation. Um, so the visualization landscape, we've heard a lot about different applications and tools in this area already. Paraview, Visit, sort of you know, more general purpose types of tools as well as domain specific applications, VMD, Vapor. And underlying those are APIs like VTK and ITK. Um, but we also have this set of data analysis tools and libraries. Um, and I put a few of them up here, but they come from different languages too, right? So if you're working in JavaScript, maybe you've seen D3 um, as sort of a low-level graphics library um, or higher-level plotting libraries in R, ggplot, Python has a bunch of different libraries, matplotlib, Altair, Bokeh, things like that. MATLAB has integrated sort of plotting tools and GNU plot, right, has been around for a while as well. So one of the places where um, these tools kind of fit in is, and been adapted is this notebook setting, right? And notebooks exist in, again, different settings. They're not confined to just one particular code set or things like that. We have uh, notebooks from mathematics like uh, Mathematica, notebooks from R, R Studio or Posit, I think as it's now known, um, and maybe, maybe the company's Posit, sorry. Um, and the observable, trying to look at sort of web-based types of uh, visualization, things like D3. Um, in my part of this talk on notebooks, I'm going to focus in on Jupyter notebooks, um, which, while often uh, talked about in the terms of Python, do extend to 
to other languages as well. Um, you can use R and JavaScript and other things like that inside of this Jupyter environment. Um, and, and what a notebook is, well, many of you have probably come across these before, but it, it blends code along with text, along with visualizations. Some of them are interactive, right? So we can see mathematical notation. Uh, we can have interactive widgets where you can control particular parameters showing a visualization. You can have dumps of arrays in these notebooks. Um, and you can see sort of the, the progress of sort of interactively querying and gaining a result from your code fairly immediately, right? And sort of having these short snippets of code as opposed to long scripts or large bodies of compiled code. And, and so I think this is one of the, the, the reasons notebooks are great for exploration. You have code, short snippets of code, you have outputs, you can even refer to some of the variables and outputs that you define in one snippet of code from another. Um, the outputs are not just limited to file names or numeric data, textual data. You can see the plots, you can see the visualizations, you can see the interactive widgets in line, um, and you can reference those outputs. Um, and another thing that's kind of useful is it has this idea of nonlinear editing. So in contrast to sort of a console type terminal environment where you type a line and if that has a typo in it, you sort of retype the code or somehow go back, um, but in a new line. In notebooks, you sort of go back to the cell that you want to change and change that code and then re-execute it and potentially re-execute things after that. And so the support for rapid exploration, I think, is really key in science, right? The flexible environment, the inline view of outputs, also this idea of talking about in situ, right, ex exploration. You run the notebooks in the browser. You can connect remotely to con kernels that are running on the machines uh, where, say, simulations and other um, more compute intensive types of code are running. Um, but they're also great for explanation, right? So um, there are some great examples of you know, explorations of, say, genetic data where there are nice widgets or ways to explore the data and write-ups, right? So notebooks thread together code as well as text. So you can explain what's going on and then show some code that demonstrates how that computation actually occurs. And so the textual explanation, the graphical explanation, interactive exploration, support for publishing from the notebooks, um, and having this sort of structure that's very clear. You just sort of read the notebook top down as you might read a paper, but you can see the code and execute the code in there, right? So this idea of reproducibility sometimes comes up talking about notebooks. Um, and so in that context, you know, an exemplar notebook might be exploring the Penguins data set here, um, reading the data in, dropping some of the columns we, we aren't interested in or dropping, uh, sorry, some of the, the data where we don't have the, the full data, uh, renaming columns, looking at average body mass, grouping by the island, things like that. And all these, this code sort of executes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? So you have this linear cell numbering. It's very clear that things happened in that particular order or at least now happen in that particular order, right? The code is going to run correctly in that top to bottom order. Now, it doesn't always happen, especially in my notebooks or maybe in some of your notebooks where you're exploring the data. As you're jumping back and forth, um, it can lead to more confusion than maybe the nice explanation that we see in some of the published notebooks, right? So here, um, we jump from cell one to cell five, and I don't see cells two, three, and four anywhere. Um, or now there are two cell fives somehow. Um, <laughs> or now we have cell seven followed by cell five. It's not in that nice uh, 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 increasing order as it used to be. Or we have errors and it's not clear why there's an error there, right? It, this ran before yesterday when I was running this data. Now why is it wrong? Well, I changed the data set here. That's the problem. And so these columns that I used to have in version one of the data set are not in version two of the data set. But how do I figure that out? How do I track down those errors? And that's one of the frustrations, I think, that comes across in the notebook. Um, uh, another thing is if you have references to variables, it's sometimes confusing to figure out which variable you're referring to. So when you're processing data through things like data frames, um, here I'm grouping, by this, I'm grouping this data frame by um, the study, but which one of those variables am I actually referring to now, right? I sort of keep reinitializing, and this is kind of common. I wanna keep my data in this variable df, but it's reappearing in multiple cells, and when I execute them in different orders, which one am I actually talking about? 
Um, and so I think some of these potholes um, sometimes slow down that explore, rapid exploration in notebooks, or maybe make it more difficult when you come back to a notebook two weeks, two years later. Uh, you know, if you redefine or mutate a variable, you can break a cell. Uh, the order of that cell execution matters, as we saw, or if you forget to run an edited cell, the result may not match the code. Um, so one of the things that I've been working on as research is really improving this link between outputs and code, right, and sort of the links between those cells. Uh, as an effect to sort of improve reuse, improve reproducibility, sort of remove those ambiguities, um, and enhance the recalls so that when you go back to a notebook, you can understand what happened with that. Um, as well as thinking about improving the displays a little bit, right? Sometimes we have these beautiful widgets for exploring genetic expression data or things like that. Um, and sometimes they turn out as big clumps of text that are really hard to diagnose. Um, so on the one side, um, one of the things we have is this sort of multiple references to the same variable, out of order cell numbers. And so the question is, how do we reference a particular um, data point? And one of the ideas here is maybe we can reference and sort of make this more um, data flow-like, where we can link together the cells via the variable names, right? So if you define DF in a particular cell, we can reference that cell by some sort of tagging mechanism, right? In this case, indicated by the dollar symbol. So um, can't talk a lot about that, but if you want to know more about it, you can look at data flow nv.github.io. Um, on the output representation side, this is something, if you've done some Python or Jupyter code, you may have run into some ugly formatted sort of sequence of data where you have nested data structures, dictionaries, and tuples, and things like that, or images. Um, and it becomes a little bit harder to sort of parse what's going on. You don't get the nice, rich outputs that you expect, right? And so one of the ideas here is can we change these types of output representations into something that's more um, uh, sort of extendable, like uh, sort of a drop-down type idea where you can see the rich, the rich pieces of the data, but you can also choose to show how much data you want to see. You're not scrolling on and on um, through lots of large data frames or images or things like that. So this project, the, the research side of things, looking at these computational notebooks, I think there's a lot of promise, and it's been demonstrated by the number of people that use notebooks um, to do efficient exploration looking at their code, looking at immediate outputs, and driving the next steps of analysis. Um, and that output then is really important. So ways that we can improve that output are, use, are very useful. Um, and in addition, being able to help that recall and reuse procedure, right? So where was this variable defined? Not having you know, variables A1, A2, and A3 sitting around, but things that are more meaningful, that mean something, or can be tagged later on. Um, so you can go to the website and look at stuff. Uh, caveat is that DF Notebook extension is, is, there's a new version that's coming out soon that's compatible with Jupyter Lab 3 and things like that. Um, so right now, the old version, not recommended to install just because it's uh, targeting two, but should be out by the end of the summer. OK, so going back to visualization in notebooks a little bit more. Um, the visualization landscape, remember we have these different types of apps, domain-specific apps, and now we want to delve into data analysis tools and libraries. And, you know, you could talk for, for many days about the type of tools in different languages and different environments. Um, I'm going to focus in on Python. And uh, that seems maybe like a more easy task, but uh, as was pointed out uh, a few years ago, the Python visualization landscape is quite varied. Um, so this map, uh, Jake Vanderplas gave a talk and sort of put together this. It's been adapted and updated with various things, um, but sort of shows the different toolkits that are out there and how they're connected to some of the main toolkits that you may have seen or main uh, programming modes that exist, right? So matplotlib is probably the most well-known visualization library in Python, um, but there are a number of libraries that have looked to JavaScript, the interactivity that's afforded in the browser and those sorts of frameworks um, to try to uh, take advantage of that and integrate with, with things like uh, D3 or Plotly and things like that. Um, and then some other tools that look at WebGL or OpenGL and try to take advantage of that more efficient rendering speed. All right, and there are other things in here that I've sort of tried to update, um, hollow views or IPy pair view connections that allow you to uh, connect from 
um, other tools that exist, pair view through the notebook and things like that. So uh, what I want to do then for the remainder of my time is sort of look at some of these more simple visualizations, right? Um, but some of these tools that exist uh, in Python and how that works with notebooks, um, leveraging matplotlib. And then as an example of sort of the JavaScript world, uh, the Altair library um, that builds on some work from a JavaScript library, Vega and Vega Lite, um, to try to sort of demonstrate a different view, a different flavor of how you can do visualization uh, for data analysis. Um, so these slides are on the Slack channel. Um, if you want to try anything out, you can try logging into jupyter.alcf.anl.gov um, and use Cooley or one of the machines there. And then the, the files should be in the track four directory. All right, before we get to those examples, um, some more background on matplotlib. Um, so matplotlib has been around for many years. Um, it orig originally was designed to be like uh, sort of a, a help for people that were used to MATLAB um, and sort of try to align a lot of the API with the sorts of calls that exist in MATLAB. Um, it has many re rendering back ends, so you can render sort of to an image or you can render to more, more interactive types of, of back ends um, that exist. So there's been a, a bunch of work to try to expand that so you can render on different contexts and things like that. Um, but you can reproduce most plots with matplotlib. Um, some of them take more doing than others, but it's very proven, well tested, right? It's been around for a while. Um, you know, some of the weaknesses that have been pointed out, the API tends to be more imperative. Um, it wasn't originally designed for the web, so some of that rendering back end, if you want some of the more interactive features, sort of had to be, um, you know, use the right extensions or use the right calls to sort of take advantage of things. Um, and, you know, some people say the styles are a little more out of date as well. Those can be updated and have been. Um, but a matplotlib figure sort of is built um, up of different pieces, right? And this is kind of similar to any plot-based visualization, chart visualization, where you start with a figure, you have axes uh, in a two-dimensional sense, x and y axes, um, and then you have titles and different things like that. You can get more detailed with the particular markers and lines and splines and other features that you can add to a visualization um, to gain to sort of better outline what the data is, a legend, for instance. On the other side of things, um, a more new, newer tool um, is something called Altair, and that focuses more on a declarative type of visualization. Um, and so the idea here is not coding sort of how the graphics are going to show up, but specify what is being encoded and how it's going to be translated to visual means, to a visualization. Um, and so there's a separation maybe from a specification, you sort of specify with the visualization to, for, to uh, what's actually going to be produced and how it's produced. Um, and so that's based on Vega Lite, which is browser-based, um, and so it takes advantage of the web technologies, the large amount of um, support that's been put into you know, JavaScript engines and browsers. And, and so if you can run an Altair visualization on a computer in a browser, you can probably run it on a phone, on a, a tablet, things like that. All you need is a web browser. Um, there is this sort of tension when you need to move the data between Python and JavaScript. Uh, sometimes the specifications are a little bit longer as well, but there are shortcuts that Altair has um, to make that a little less cumbersome. Um, but one of the things that this idea of declarative visualization uh, makes you think about is something that those of us in visualization like to, to talk about is more of a, a framework for how do you break down a visualization into the core components. And, and you know, Tamara Munzner and others have sort of put together these ideas of marks and channels. Um, and marks basically being the, the building blocks, the graphical elements of a visualization, things like points, lines, areas. Right? So if you're drawing a line plot, obviously you're doing lines. A scatter plot is made of points. Um, a tree map or something like that is built of area marks. Um, but they're kind of like the geometry, right? So if you're used to Illustrator or Inkscape, the idea here is you're sort of drawing a path or drawing a shape. And then after that, you can add on all of the different graphical properties, things like the line width, the fill color, patterns, things like that. Right, so Altair tries to adhere to this idea of area marks, but also has things that 
you know, are, are more tailored to specific situations like ge geographic data, so geo shapes or image data, things like that. Um, but the idea is that then once you have these marks, your data properties are encoded by these visual channels. So you're mapping an attribute of the data to a particular visual property, right? So something like color, right? I can take the pressure and use that color map that we've seen in many of the tools today, right? To take the values, those floating point values, and translate those into the colors that then show up in the visualization. Uh, but you can also do this for other types of things. So if you have something where it's more categorical in nature, right? So I have different um, brand, uh, models of cars or something like that, right? That's not something that's a continuous type of, you know, there's sort of like a, the Ford and then the Chevrolet and something like that. There, there's no order to those. They're just different things. And so something like shape works better to encode that sort of information, right? They're just different shapes. They're different types of models. And so um, in visualization, we like to talk about this split between the different types of um, attributes and how those best map to different channels. But there also is some artistic um, license in visualization, right? D deciding on what the best color map is. Sometimes that depends on the field you're in. Um, sometimes there's perception concerns to be aware of, things like color blindness, right? So there's a lot of things that come into play because instead of communicating via, you know, numbers that come out on the console, you're communicating via something that people have to then interpret, right? Light waves come into your eyes, have to be decoded, brains processing, you have to deal with visual illusions and things like that that might come up. So there's um, a lot of influence in the visualization community uh, from studies of how uh, human vision happens and the sorts of uh, shortcuts that our brains take sometimes in interpreting data that we need to be aware of when we visualize the data. All right, so um, for the remainder of my time, I want to sort of show some of these notebooks. Um, and again, if you want to follow along, uh, you can look at the slides uh, for this sort of list, but you can go to the track four directory um, online. So switch over here. So um, what you get, uh, I'm just going to stay logged in just so that I don't <laughs> bring up any errors. Uh, but when you try to go to jupiter.aclf.anl.gov, you would log in with your credentials, and then you'd come to a screen, something like this, after your server starts up. Uh, probably won't have anything in it, but you can create a new, um, a new notebook from there, um, like a Python notebook for something like that. Or you can choose to upload a notebook. So if you download um, one of the Airfoil, like the Air, Airfoil Flow notebook, you could upload that to the server, and then you could run that uh, notebook on the Jupyter server. So if I open that, I already have opened it, so let's not make another version of it. Um, what we have is these different cells, right? So each one of the cells, as I click through, um, is either something that's textual, right? So something that's a markdown cell. Um, if I double click on that, you can see, um, you know, it's written in a particular format where you have this markdown format. Headings have pound signs in front of them. Links have this type of uh, description text followed by the URL and so on and so forth. Um, and shift enter will execute cells, in this case, rendering the markdown. Um, one of the things that in Python code you often have to do is import the libraries, right? So I can import things like matplotlib. There are particular conventions for, for matplotlib, usually to import the pyplot library as plt and things like that. Um, I can set my directory of where the data is. I can load a particular file name. Um, in this case, use numpy to load in an array of data. Right, and I can just see this is a bunch of scalars, in this case, float32. Um, I can interrogate this data and see how much data I have. Right, so in this case, it's a one-dimensional array that has over a million elements. But in this case, I know this data is actually um, 1024 by 1024, so I can ask NumPy to reshape that data. Right, one of these data transformation steps that often goes along with visualization. Before I can get the visualization, I've got to transform the data in some way. Uh, now I can look at that data in, in that way. But the important piece is, is being able to sort of start visualizing this data, right? And so um, the initial plot of this data, just sort of taking the, the raw floating point values and translating them via color map, um, gives me something that isn't all that interesting, right? It's a yellow blob with the black blob in the middle. Um, and so 
I could make a bigger image and inspect this further to see if I'm missing something. Um, and I'm not. It's still basically the same thing. And so I might go talk to somebody where this data came from or look up some of the documentation um, and realize, oh, there are these dummy values basically where the airfoil is located that indicate empty space that are negative 1,000, right? And so really I should be setting those to a value that indicates that they're missing, in this case, NAN. Um, and if I do that and then re-render the data, I get something that tells me a little bit more, right? I can see there's some um, change in the color across the values now, right? Because I flagged that data particularly. All right, and I can change this color map as we've seen, you know, through point and click interfaces and other sorts of tools. I can change this color map um, to a different version and I can go ahead and clamp the data as, or change the, the background data in this case to black instead of white and clamp the data so that I can see a little bit more of the variation, not focus on those outliers um, that were again mentioned in a previous session, right? So now I can get a little bit better idea of how these values are changing around the airfoil. Um, and we can add labels to the visualization. So um, set the Y label, set the X label, set a title. We can change things about the font, right? And these are important pieces, right? If you may know what your visualization shows with just the axes, but if somebody else comes across this later on, they're going to have to re-sort of figure out what's going on and, and what the deal is with all of this data unless you choose to label things. All right, so I can change the font sizes, make it a little bit easier to see. I can add a color bar, a legend on the outside that tells me what these values are. And I can rotate um, some of the labels to make this a little more visible. And in this case, to show that I've clamped the color map, I can extend the color bar um, with the arrows on the side to sort of indicate that the values do go beyond um, negative 1.0 and 0.4, but I've clamped them to those values. Um, and you can even go ahead and, and not just look at a single frame of this data, or a single time step, um, but go ahead and look at all, all the, the steps in the data and put together an animation that shows uh, what's going on. And I, instead of rendering this, this is really slow on Jupyter um, earlier, so I'm going to just play back what I have here. It's a little bit smaller. All right, but now from the animation, right, you can sort of see how the air, you know, is moving around this airfoil as, as the time changes, right? And this can be useful in terms of seeing what's going on, seeing how the simulation works, uh, and, and things like that in that case. All right. So that's the whirlwind tour of, of Matplotlib and how the notebook can help, uh, you know, with these few pieces of code sort of iteratively refine what your visualization is, right? So you look at the data, figure some things out, refine the data, transform the data, add more labels, and get to a visualization that then um, can be part of the research record. All right, so um, looking at some, some other data here, we can look at the magnitude, uh, velocity magnitude here, using Altair. Um, you probably have to install Altair. I don't think that's installed by default on the Jupyter ALCF server. Um, I'm going to skip that step for now because I already installed it. Um, but I can load in all this data again. And instead of looking at um, the raw values, I can look at something like the mins and the maxes um, using a data analysis tool like Pandas here. Uh, the mins, the maxes, and the means, right? And maybe I want to plot those. Um, there's connections from Pandas, which is this data analysis library, um, to uh, Matplotlib and other backends have also tried to add support for things like this where I can look at how the maximum value changes over time. Um, can do some more data transformations to look at the max, the min, and the mean so that I can plot all of those things a different way. And there's different ways to do this. And then if I jump to Altair, right, you can see there's a difference in how this is specified. I'm specifying the type of mark that I'm going to use, in this case, a line mark. And I'm going to encode it um, using the x values from the step attribute and the y values from the max attribute, right? And so I'm specifying sort of in that encoding which attributes match to, in this case, x position and y position. And if I want to change something like the scale, I specify that in my specification of the visualizations so that I don't have to start 
at zero, right? When I start at zero, you know, that gives me a nice baseline and shows that things aren't changing that much. But if I really want to see the variation better, um, not having it sort of allowing it to change that Y scale will allow me to see the variation a little bit better. All right, and I can change that, show in this case, instead of sort of having this idea that I'm showing the maximum and the mean and specifying that, I can change the encoding so that color specifies the type of variable here, right? So instead of showing X, Y, and, and that's it, I can add this color um, attribute where it matches the max, the mean, and the min to that color that way. Right, and I can even go further um, and change the type of scale here, symmetric log. Or in this case, show sort of the composition that Altair allows you to sort of build up these primitives and encodings together. So here what I have is sort of four different visualizations. Um, one that's showing sort of an area mark. It's going to fill in the region between the max and the min. And then three line charts, the min, the max, and the mean. Right? And this addition operator is sort of composing all of these different layers of the visualization together so that what I get in the end is this uh, visualization that shows me those three lines and then this area that's in between the max and the min. And so you, you get the flavor of sort of you're building things up and, and composing things from these marks and channels um, in a little bit different way than what matplotlib does, right? So it's, it's just an interesting um, difference between the types of visualizations that matplotlib and Altair have. All right, so you can play around with these libraries more. One thing you might notice here is that my autosave failed. Um, there's something goofy with the most recent version of Altair and I think the Jupyter server here where if you create the Jupyter visualization or the Altair visualizations, they're rendered as PNGs or something that don't allow Jupyter to save the notebook. So that's what's going on there. Um, but you should be able to run things without any problem. All right. So that is the sort of whirlwind tour talking about why notebooks are important in visualization and sort of how the connection between your computations and your outputs can really help rapid um, knowledge insights grow. Um, and we have these two different tools among the many tools that exist in the visualization landscape um, to sort of connect code via matplotlib and Altair together. Thank you.